On this baccalaureate Sunday, will you join me in extending to our guest a warm Boston University Marsh Chapel greeting. Thank you, and Dean Hill, for the warmth of that greeting. As he said, I feel like I'm among family this morning. You know, it's clear that Boston University has thrived under President Brown's leadership. Among his other attributes, I can tell you he's a hard man to say no to. <laughs> after, after I had accepted with pleasure his invitation to receive an honorary degree, only then did he tell me that he would like me to give this baccalaureate address. So I feel a bit like those wandering medieval minstrels or even little Tommy Tucker from the nursery rhyme who had to sing first before having supper. But my, what a glorious supper, what a glorious feast this is, one filled with joy and pride and hope and expectations. This morning's service envelops you in the spiritual realm. Later today, you honor people of great distinction from technology, commerce, the arts, sciences, and military service. I want to speak of a different realm, the civil realm, the realm of citizenship, of love of country, and of your government. One of the greatest fortunes of your lives is that you are participants in our American democracy with its independent judiciary and its system of justice. Our democracy is built on both the checks and balances structure of the three branches of government and on the Constitution and its Bill of Rights which limit government. The executive and legislative branches are meant to reflect the political will of the voters. In the judicial branch, unlike the other two branches, we judges take an oath of impartiality, not to be partisan. The oath we take says we will do our jobs without fear or favor. This system is the envy of the entire world. Your counterparts elsewhere in the world, in Syria, in the Arab Spring, in Russia, in Iran, in China, in Chile, to give just a few examples, have put their lives at risk to achieve what you have. Dr. Martin Luther King said, there is nothing in the world greater than freedom. In this country, we have one secular document, which is a sacred text. It is the United States Constitution. And under that, you enjoy considerable freedoms, including the freedom of academic inquiry here at Boston University. You have the freedom to worship your own religion and not be forced to attend to another. You enjoy freedom from arbitrary police and government action. But most significantly, you have the ability to change your government and to change your country. You enjoy freedom of speech, of association, and the benefits of a free press. You have the ability to vote, the ability to communicate your views, and to challenge and change a government you do not like. You have the ability to make laws and to change laws, and to do so in order to face the problems your generation sees. Now, all of these freedoms are important human values in their own right, and they are worth preserving. But as Justice Sandra Day O'Connor has said, our constitutional values are not embedded in the human gene code. Indeed, far from it. They must be taught 
and valued and used, lest they be lost. Our system of government has worked remarkably well for over two centuries. It has gotten our country through profound problems, and it has changed who we are and done so for the better. My own life experiences tell me this is true, and it will be true for you. When I came to BU, the country was rocked by unrest. The problems were so difficult, my generation wondered if we would survive. It was the era of the possibility of nuclear annihilation, of the civil rights movement, of the women's movement, and the anti-war movement. Blatant race and gender discrimination were prevalent. Extreme inequities in access to opportunity had led to demonstrations, riots, the burning of neighborhoods, and clashes with police. There was the killing of students at Kent State, and this campus was torn by dissent and student strikes. During this time, and in the streets of the civilized city of Boston, I was tear-gassed while marching to protest the war in Vietnam. And memorably, I was called foul names by ugly crowds when I marched with people of color in favor of civil rights. Indeed, I wondered if I would graduate from law school. I ran out of money, and it looked like I would never be a lawyer. But the student loan program had just been enacted by Congress, and that enabled me to stand where I now am. My fears about the future were captured in the words of William Butler Yeats in his poem, The Second Coming. He wrote, things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The problems we faced were daunting, but under our democracy, we got through them. The hymn we just sang at this service was, Behold a Broken World. You know better than I the problems of this broken world, and you know that both you and your country must somehow address them. There is much corrosive cynicism today, much polarization, much lack of civility. Some say they have no faith in government to address problems. It would be reasonable for you to ask whether the fact that our democracy has served us so well for so long is any assurance at all that it will lead you to solve the problems that we face. My response is that our democratic form of government and the tools the Constitution gives you provide some of the best ways you have of addressing those problems. And I also answer that if you do not use those tools, including your right to vote, to speak, to organize, in order to assure that your government will be honest, responsive, and relevant, the chances of you coming to solutions are considerably less. You are graduating and being asked to take responsibility for yourself and your own life. But the scope of that responsibility goes beyond yourself to the sort of society in which you live. For my generation, John Kennedy famously asked, ask not what your country could do for you, but what you can do for your country. Your country still needs you, perhaps now more than then. That responsibility means preserving the institutions of your democracy, which are the institutions of government, it also means exercising those freedoms the Constitution has given you. BU students have done this before. 45 years ago, students on this campus used those tools and they changed our country. Defying a state law, a man named William Baird gave a lecture at Boston University to over 2,500 students. 
His topic was birth control. During the lecture, an unmarried 19-year-old female student accepted from Baird some contraceptive foam. Under state law, married people, but not unmarried people, could legally be given contraception. Baird was arrested and convicted for violating the state law prohibiting distribution of contraceptives to unmarried people. The penalty he faced was up to five years of imprisonment. The whole event had been del deliberately set up on the BU campus in order to bring a constitutional challenge to that law. And the federal court on which I now sit held that the state law was unconstitutional and ordered Baird release on the great writ of habeas corpus. In 1972, the Supreme Court agreed in a case called Eisenstadt versus Baird, named after the then sheriff and Mr. Baird. And when the story is told, it is most often Bill Baird who is given the credit. But let me shift the perspective. Of all of the college campuses in the Boston area, this took place at BU. And that does not surprise me. BU has always looked to the future. But more than that, credit must be given to the BU students who went to the lecture and particularly to the unmarried 19-year-old female undergraduate who made the test case possible. Those students wanted to change an unjust law and to expand the protection of individual freedoms. This was no small matter, and it was not merely about contraceptives. The overturning of this state law led to the development of doctrines of constitutionally protected personal privacy, which have reshaped our society. Now, these changes take time. They take great patience and perseverance. But as Dr. King also said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. You have the keys to affect your future and to take steps to be sure the center holds. Take responsibility. Go forward with your intelligence, your education, and with courage. Use these tools and freedoms that our American democracy and its system of laws have given you. I stand before you a federal judge. I'm of the baby boomer generation. We are handing power over to you, the next generations. We give into your hands the safekeeping of our Constitution and our democracy. Please, we ask you, keep them safe and flourishing. Thank you.